be negative note because that's essentially how, how it has started really for me. And that I'm going to give you a very quick snapshot of some of what's been written about the Irish data protection regime or said in, in a very public international privacy fora over the last few months. Uh, and as Eamon said earlier, this is of course uh, in, in no way a reflection uh, on my predecessor. This is simply uh, what, what has been said uh, about the regime and their issues of perception, I think, mainly. Uh, so in the first few weeks in the job, I attended the International Conference of Data Protection Commissioners. Uh, and one of the uh, main data protection authorities in Europe welcomed me to my new world by pointing out to me that there's a view of Ireland that the government attracts in big software multinationals with questionable tax incentives and that I, or the regulator in Ireland, retains those jobs in Ireland by softly regulating them in data protection terms. And they said your job on behalf of government seems to be not to rock the boat and there's a perception that the office in Ireland is not independent of government as it's required to be. At that same event, one of the world's leading privacy lawyers at one of the plenary sessions outlined that there's alleged evidence of forum shopping on the part of companies in terms of where they locate their data-rich operations in Europe, and a perception that they locate where the soft or incompetent and under-resourced regulators are. And unfortunately, he wasn't handing out prizes uh, for people to guess which jurisdiction he was referring to. Then at one of the largest European data protection events this year in, in Europe, it's the International Association of Privacy Professionals, their annual conference in November in Brussels. A moderator at one of the plenary sessions in front of a global audience of 800 said, oh yes, we've all seen the photos of the Irish Data Protection Office over the spa shop and had a good laugh. So they didn't get that quite right. It's in fact a centra shop that we were located over. But, but I think the sentiment was clear. Also stated at that same event, Ireland does not enforce data protection laws. It writes enforcement notices in the form of dear large multinational, please stop, kiss, 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 the data protection commissioner. Uh, Ireland's judiciary apparently knows nothing about data protection laws. The new data protection commissioner, i.e. me, does not come from a human rights background. Uh, and then, uh, in a recent purportedly humorous IAPP commentary on what can be expected in the data protection world for 2015, it cites a prediction for April that starts with, tired of criticisms from the continent, Ireland decides to settle once and for all questions about its dedication to internet privacy. Now, I won't read out the rest of the prediction, it's a Star Wars reference and not very funny, but again, we see this articulation of the idea that we're the butt of criticism from the continent. Uh, and seeking to address these. And in case you think I'm dwelling just on the negative and forgetting to mention all the lovely things that have been said about us, that, that's not really the case. The overwhelming direction of views, particularly expressed by our European peers, is not complimentary. And while we've allies in countries like the UK and Luxembourg who fall subject to, to some of the same criticisms, it does seem to me we occupy a very special place on the list, and it's possibly because of the types of companies that we are regulating here in Ireland. As I said earlier, I think most of the issues cited are issues of perception rather than of substance, although the issue of the adequacy of resourcing of the Data Protection Office in Ireland is certainly one that's difficult to argue with. Uh, and I think it's very important that we start to address these issues because I think if they remain unaddressed, they're going to affect companies based in Ireland. Certainly the companies that I have interacted with so far, they don't want to be softly regulated. They certainly don't want to be incompetently regulated, and they don't want to have to fight a perception that that's the case. I think also when addressed, these issues are going to affect Ireland's ability to be a player as a lead regulator under the new proposed European Data Protection Regulation, and they're also going to importantly undermine European and Irish data subject confidence in, in regulation in this area. So in terms of what's led to these perceptions uh, and, and what we can do about them, I think undoubtedly some of them are manifestations of a wider political rivalry. Ireland's corporate tax regime uh, has, has long been the subject of comment and debate. And I think to the extent that data protection is now spoken about as a tool of industrial policy, there's some spillover of that rivalry into this area. Probably as a regulator, there's very little I can do about this other than to keep on demonstrating through the actions of the Irish Data Protection Authority, that we are strongly independent of government in the performance of our functions and, importantly, in the decisions that we take 
uh, and I firmly believe this has always been the case. Further perception issues, I think, arise <coughs> for Ireland uh, because of the fact that the 1995 EU data protection regulation under which we all operate has been transposed differently in the different member states. And in Ireland, we have a statutory focus on amicable resolution of complaints between a data subject and data controller where possible. And I think this is very positive and pra pragmatic. It leads to rapid outcomes and positive impacts for, for individual data subjects. But I think it can leave us open to the challenge that we're not heavy enough in visible enforcement terms. However, I'd like to point out, as I'm sure my predecessor did, that in fact the Irish Data Protection Authority has stronger powers in many important areas compared to other data protection authorities, and that we have very strong audit powers and we have strong legal powers to rectify non-compliance. Uh, for example, we have conducted two very large-scale audits of Facebook and LinkedIn's European operations, and these audits have led to those companies implementing a large number of privacy-improving changes. The UK Data Protection Authority, for example, wouldn't have any such powers to audit private sector organisations. In addition, where necessary, we have powers to effectively force companies to cease their operations uh, until the data protection issues we've identified are corrected. And you would have seen this with the large-scale loyalty build breach in 2013. It's important to mention also as a regulator in 2014 that Ireland has for the first time prosecuted company directors. Uh, it was a private investigator company, in this case MCK Investigations, in October of 2014 for their role in their company's data protection offences. So we're sending out the strong, strongest possible signal as an enforcer here that not only will we prosecute companies where they breach data protection rules, but we will hold those who manage and direct the companies uh, to account as well. And I think the significance of this case and the fact that we prosecuted the directors uh, in this case has not gone unnoticed based on the uh, flurry of visits I've had from companies uh, since that time in October. However, all of that outlined not so much in defence of the office, but really in setting out the facts in terms of our enforcement activity. I think there are a number of things in 2015 that the Irish Data Protection Authority can do to improve its performance, and importantly, the perception of its performance. One of the things we need to do is better develop our media handling and public relations uh, activity. We really have uh, very scant resources in the office covering this function. Uh, at the moment, and it is important to be able to articulate and push out our message. So this is something we're going to proactively target for improvement in 2015. In addition, in Ireland, we, we handle and we're obliged to handle <coughs> every complaint we receive from the office in, into the office to completion. And of course, we want to hear data subject complaints. We need to hear them. We need to know what's happening in organisations and how they're treating personal data. But I think we need to reorientate somewhat how we are dealing with some of the complaints that we receive in that we need to better moderate the level of intervention we maintain in certain cases between a data subject and a data controller. Quite a number of the resources of the office can be tied up in dealing with complaints that are really not of any systemic importance in terms of what's been identified, they're very technical breaches, or they relate very much to wider grievances of, of a particular data subject that aren't really data protection issues. And I think in those cases, there is often no satisfactory outcome that can be reached. So we need to do some reorientation and start prioritizing uh, in order to optimize our role as a regulator in delivering outcomes that deliver privacy across the board. And in re reorientating how we deal with certain complaints, that's not to say we'll be diminishing in any way the rights of any individual data subject, but merely, as I said, optimizing our role as a regulator. In terms of location, whatever about the uh, office being located over a supermarket, I think the criticisms of the Data Protection Commissioner being exclusively located in Port Arlington are probably merited. Uh, the Data Protection Office does need to have a premises in, in Dublin in order to effectively deal face to face with the many government headquarters that are located in the capital and also companies. Um, and as you heard earlier, the government has now committed a significant budget to allow us to rectify this situation. The OPW is currently uh, hunting for a suitable city centre premises uh, for the office. They're not being very positive at the moment in terms of the options that are available, but we'll keep working with them. So we'll effectively have two locations of the office. We'll maintain the regional office, we'll have the office in the capital, we'll be interconnected uh, and working electronically and seamlessly with each other. 
I think many of you here today will be very well aware that the Data Protection Office has been under-resourced uh, in staff quantity terms, but also in terms of specialist skills over the last number of years. And in addition, we've had insufficient investment in terms of the back office systems that we're using and the front end processing systems for customer complaints. So I'm very pleased, but I'm even more relieved that the government has now sanctioned this additional budget uh, and provided the sanction for recruitment of additional staff. So we already have a recruitment campaign underway now in the new year to immediately recruit 18 new staff to the office. These will all be Dublin-based staff. <coughs> Uh, and uh, ultimately the plan is that we will recruit an additional 45 staff. We have 29, 28 staff uh, based down in Port Arlington. I mentioned the OPW is looking for a Dublin premises for us. Um, they've let me know that even if they locate something very quickly by the time fit-out is completed, it's likely to be the end of the year. So I think we'll be looking at having a, a temporary uh, premises in Dublin in the short term and then a permanent pre premises from next year onwards. And we'll advise you of the data or of, of the address uh, of that premises as soon as we can. Uh, I mentioned earlier to colleagues that I visited just before Christmas my UK counterpart to talk to him about the profile of his 400 person team just to get some ideas in terms of the type of skills that we might recruit in. So I got some very good ideas uh, in, in, in terms of what's worked for them and we're trying to implement all of that now. Another big area that we want to target for improvement in 2015 is how we work in cooperation with other data protection authorities. You're probably aware that Ireland is part of a permanent working party of data protection authorities in Europe called the Article 29 Working Party under the 1995 Data Protection Directive. And we're also part of a global data protection enforcement network called GPEN, where we've strong links to the FTC in the US and the Canadian Data Protection Commissioner in particular. And obviously this type of cooperation is essential, particularly where Ireland is regulating uh, data-rich companies with, with all of the cross-border data flows. Uh, that this implies. Um, to date, as I mentioned earlier, at a European level there can be a perception that we're at odds uh, with the approach of our larger continental neighbours uh, in terms of regulation of, of data-rich multinationals. Uh, but I think no, no real evidence of, of this has been adduced. That said, I think it's probably our lack of bandwidth and resources that we've deployed to Article 29 and its various working parties uh, that is probably contributing to this view that we're not entirely trustworthy uh, or competent. We have had to make big decisions in the past in the case of Facebook breaches. And I think in a context where our Article 29 partners don't see us often enough, enough at meetings, at subgroups, expressing views and building knowledge of the context in which Ireland makes its decisions, I think that has led to some of these issues. In addition, you'll be aware that the Article 29 Working Party uh, regularly issues opinions which are not binding but are extremely influential on important areas in relation to data protection matters. And at the moment Ireland isn't really a voice uh, at the uh, table in terms of negotiations of the positions that are adopted in terms of these opinions. And I think it's important that we, we sit down at the table and that we're there. Um, so, in that context, I think despite the fact that uh, as an office we've worked proactively already in terms of these audits we've done with some of the large multinationals, we have expertise that other countries don't have in data protection terms as regulators, but this isn't yet recognised or appreciated at EU level, and I think we need to rectify that by having more staff on the ground. So in summary then, 2015 is going to be a year of significant recruitment and expansion of resources for the Irish Data Protection Authority, establishment of new premises and capital, new systems and tools for staff to work with, greater participation at Article 29 uh, and in its various subgroups. Um, and in addition, in the context of having all of these additional resources, we want to increase and improve the proactive and reactive engagement we have with companies and organisations based in Ireland. It's probably worth mentioning at this point that because we are looking to implement a big change programme uh, at the Data Protection Commissioner during this year, the senior resources of the office, including myself, are probably going to inevitably be more internally focused uh, while we do that. So, you know, I get about, I don't know, maybe 20 requests a day to speak at various different events and it, it can be hard to turn them down. But I think we are going to have to manage 
the, the amount of travel and speaking at events that we do over the next number of months. Just want to very quickly, if I still have time, mention plenty of time, good. Uh, some of what I'm seeing as the big themes uh, in, in data protection, certainly in the conversations I'm having over the last number of months. I think the first one that's worth mentioning is jurisdiction. This, this has for uh, the longest time uh, been a complex matter in the world of data and data protection, uh, but it appears to have grown even more complex, I think, post the European or, or the ECJ's judgment in the Google Spain case this summer. This was, of course, the case that recognised uh, a right to be, a so-called right to be forgotten. And as part of its judgment in that case, the court ruled that even though Google declares itself as having its seat in the US, and has its data controller operations in the US and not Europe. But the fact that it's operating a subsidiary in Spain, in this case, that sells Google advertising with the aim of making the search engine profitable, then it is established for the purposes of the 1995 directive in Spain or any other EU country, every other EU country in which it has similar operations. And so it ruled that Spain did have jurisdiction in terms of requiring Google to comply with its data protection laws. And in terms of the multinationals we regulate in Ireland, we're now seeing potentially some interesting interpretations of jurisdiction based on that ECJ judgment. I'll take, for example, the case of Facebook. Uh, Facebook would have declared its main establishment in Europe in data protection terms to be in Ireland. And so any user of Facebook service signs up to Facebook Ireland Limited uh, when it's signing up to terms and conditions. Uh, and so for the last number of years, Ireland has effectively been the regulator uh, for Facebook in terms of any complaints, be they complaints from Irish nationals or from other jurisdictions. So other data protection authorities would pass on their complaints in respect to Facebook uh, and we would investigate them and reach a decision. Uh, so over the last number of months, uh, we have been working with Facebook in terms of new terms and conditions and privacy policy that it plans to roll out this month. Uh, and there would have been a, a significant uh, amount of engagement on this and it would have reached conclusion uh, in November or, or in fact in December uh, of last year uh, allowing Facebook to proceed with its plans. However, using the Google Spain judgment as its basis in the latter weeks of December, we've now seen the Dutch Data Protection Authority make a preemptive move in this area and they publicly announced through a press release, so I'm not, I'm not revealing anything you won't already know, they announced that they are investigating Facebook's new privacy policy in terms and conditions. So they haven't been more specific as to what exactly and which aspect of it they're investigating. But they're asserting jurisdiction insofar as it affects Dutch nationals based on that Google Spain judgment. I think companies will speak for themselves as to how they find that development and I know Facebook has publicly expressed its disappointment uh, in, in terms of, of the Dutch move given the amount of work they have done in working on this project with the Irish Authority. But from the perspective of Ireland's Data Protection Authority, I think this development is starting to underline the challenges that Ireland may envisage when it is acting as a lead authority under the proposed one-stop shop in the draft EU data protection regulation, which I'll touch on again shortly. So our exclusive competence in respect of dealing with uh, companies such as Facebook controlled in Ireland under the 1995 directive is therefore already now coming under threat of reinterpretation in light of the Google Spain judgment. And the manner in which this is occurring, this reinvestigation uh, of aspects that we have already spent months uh, engaging on doesn't, I think, augur well in terms of our role as a lead DPA under the Data Protection Regulation. I was going to mention somewhat extensively the Microsoft case as well, as it's one that concerns jurisdiction. This is the one where Microsoft refused to accede to a US court-issued search and seizure warrant requiring them to hand over email content. Uh, and they refused because the email content, they say, is stored on, on a server at its facility in Ireland. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about it because the government has since filed uh, an amicus, amicus brief uh, in favour of Microsoft in this case, but I think the judgment is due from the US court in January and it's going to be a case that will help us. Uh, it'll be interesting, I think, and instructive in, in terms of jurisdiction. Surveillance is also an area that uh, is uh, occupying the minds of Article 29 regulators quite, quite considerably. 
Um, the Snowden revelations of 2013 and more recently now the revelations of GCHQ tapping of cables between Ireland and the UK have given immediate rise to significant concerns and they've also resulted in quite a number of queries and a couple of complaints uh, to the Irish Data Protection Office, which would be aware that essentially surveillance is outside of the scope of the 1995 directive because of its national security exemptions. But I think there's a feeling now that that's not sufficiently defined. Uh, I think regulators are, are of the view that while we're never going to fully know what's going on in national security terms, we need a definition of what is covered by this area and we need definition of what the issues uh, in the areas are. So ultimately, it's probably one for the courts and the legislature, but uh, certainly Article 29 uh, is, is tracking this very, very carefully. Other themes at international level uh, relate to big data and Internet of Things. Um, the Article 29 Working Party issued uh, a paper on Internet of, of Things at the end of 2014. Uh, there's a lot, there really is a lot of concern amongst my peers in Europe uh, about these particular subjects. Some of them feel we're very much moving towards uh, a world of digital predetermination uh, of humans, as they call it, and they see a sort of a doomsday scenario where some of our human free will is going to be removed from us because uh, everything that we're looking at is, is so digitally predetermined based on our own personal preferences that have been recorded. I don't think I quite uh, share the level of pessimism that my colleagues have, but, th but there is clearly an issue in terms of the speed at which technical innovation and social media in particular with its online behavioural advertising features has vastly outpaced legislation and regulation and it is going to take some clever uh, and long-term fixing and regulators have a role to play in this, but ultimately I think these probably are uh, very much uh, areas that are going to need political and societal solutions as well. I mentioned earlier the Google Spain judgment and the right to be forgotten. Uh, the Article 29 Working Party issued guidance on decision making on right to be forgotten cases and so all of the data protection authorities at the moment are working through appeals. Ireland has received about 30 appeals uh, in relation to cases where Google has refused to, to delist. Uh, so there's quite a volume of work uh, in, involved in this and um, it's clearly an area that, that's evolving. I thought, I thought it was quite interesting at some of the four I attended to, to hear the US reaction to that judgment because clearly it's been one of, of considerable surprise at, uh, at the judgment of the court in that case. Uh, the US are also particularly uh, keen on a renaming of the right and, and argue quite correctly that, that it's not right to call it a right to be forgotten because as you know it results in a delisting only where there's a search done on the personal name of the person if you search for the particular story on it, under any other combination other than, on, other than personal name the information is still available. It's worth remarking I think that uh, the ECJ has been uh, a massive player last year in terms of uh, expanding our knowledge uh, and understanding of, of matters in data protection terms. You'll be aware it struck down the EU data protection or data retention directive in May of this year and that was just a month before it recognised the so-called right to be forgotten. And then more recently we've seen it issue a judgement at the end of the year in relation to a case that concerned household CCTV usage uh, and we're still examining that case but it seems to me that it may have uh, broader implications in that the judgment touches on the household exemption uh, that applies under the 1995 directive uh, and while this was a case about CCTV a lot of the companies we regulate in Ireland uh, would rely on the household exemption in terms of the ability of users to upload their contact list to a product like Facebook uh, or Google or LinkedIn. Um, and now the court is suggesting that the application of that household exemption is, is a lot narrower. So more to come, I think, in that space. The other big area uh, of, of interest is, of course, the EU data protection regulation. Um, under the Lisbon Treaty, there's now recognition of personal data as a fundamental right, providing it with a renewed and elevated status. And as you're aware, this EU data protection regulation was proposed uh, to bring in a pan-European network so that we're not dealing with these different transpositions of a directive in Europe 
uh, it was intended to level the playing field and provide consistency in terms of application of the law in Europe. And a very significant feature of, of the framework that's proposed is this idea of a one-stop shop. And in the original Commission proposal on the one-stop shop, they had proposed this idea that multinationals, instead of having to hawk around 28 member states, would be able to declare a main establishment and deal with one lead authority in the country where they had that main establishment. And the idea was that the lead authority where they would receive a complaint from anywhere in Europe, from a data subject anywhere in Europe, would investigate the complaint, uh, would consult with relevant data protection authorities as needed, would take on board their opinions, would take on board any opinions of, of the Commission, uh, and then would propose a final solution. However, concerns uh, over time have been raised about uh, the fact that this approach means that justice could be inaccessible for data subjects not located uh, where the lead authority is. So, for example, if I investigated uh, a complaint from a Spanish data subject about Facebook, if they wanted to appeal my decision, they would have to appeal it in the Irish courts. So now we have a new proposal on the table, uh, and it's now proposed that where a lead authority is going to propose a decision, they would have to have that accepted uh, on, on a consensus and unanimous basis by all of the other data protection authorities. So any one data protection authority could, could veto the proposed decision. And if that occurs, then the decision is referred on to the uh, European Data Protection Board, which is going to be established as a board of all of the data protection authorities. Um, so I think for me, this presents the worry that as a regulator, we could end up becoming a chief coordinator in that we would investigate a decision, we would coordinate with all of the relevant data protection authorities, which could be all of them. Uh, we would work <coughs> at uh, doing a balancing test, proposing a decision, and ultimately, it could be vetoed and the issue referred on to the European Data Protection Board. Uh, and I think it creates a vista of a lack of certainty then for companies who are dealing with Ireland as a lead data protection authority uh, and, uh, as I said, may cast us in the role of chief coordinator rather than lead decision maker. But the negotiations aren't completed on that, so all is not, not lost yet. I'll just briefly mention, because um, I am running out of time, uh, the major Irish government uh, projects that we're dealing with at the moment. And uh, I mean, the list is as long as both my arms, so I'm only going to touch on a couple of them as examples. Irish Water, uh, with no pun intended, would have swamped our office for the months of September and October. We were simply dealing with nothing but Irish Water and PPSNs. Um, Air code could be the next big uh, wave of privacy matters that we deal with the governments. Uh, intention to in introduce a national postcode system, which as you know is going to be a system where the postcode is unique to each individual dwelling, so right down to apartment level uh, and uh, also it's going to be a randomised code rather than a hierarchical code. So the form of code that's been introduced uh, is, is in the form of personal data as it would be recognised under the Data Protection Act and is going to have to be uh, protected as such, which is going to arise, I think, uh, undoubtedly to complications. The other big area we've been dealing with is in relation to the Department of Public Expenditure and Reforms data sharing proposals, uh, and uh, there's a lot of work still ongoing on that. So all of, I mean, I've only mentioned a tiny number of them there. All of the government data projects are extremely time-consuming. None of them are straightforward. They're extremely complex. Um, I am trying to encourage government departments and government bodies to do much more of the groundwork in data protection terms before they come to the Data Protection Commissioner in terms of the projects that they're proposing. We're tending to see projects at a very late stage where, where data protection is sort of a, a, a tack on and a nuisance that's to be dealt with uh, rather than seeing the groundwork uh, being done. So, in conclusion, I think 2015 is going to be a very exciting year for the Irish Data Protection Office. We're finally going to be in recruitment mode and expanding and growing our skills base to better deliver on our statutory functions. We're going to be growing our relationships with other enforcers and regulators in Europe and beyond. And while, as I said, we're delivering on that challenge and change programme, there's going to be a lot going on in terms of large-scale government projects, tracking the EU regulation, regulating the large multinationals, including the social networking sites that are here, 
managing our relationships with Europe, but we're going to be working very hard on delivering across the board. That's it. Thank you.